So it's becoming abundantly clear that in many Australian cities and towns it's easier for a renter to climb Mount Everest than purchase a new home. That is, without the financial help of mum and dad. On, average, on an average income, it would take over 10 years to save the 20% deposit you need for a typical home. And we're told that everything with the kitchen sink is being thrown at the problem without much success. But is an obvious solution actually staring us in the face something we've tried before? The Drum's David Taylor takes a look. Scott Morrison has some advice for aspiring homeowners. Best way to support people who are renting a house is to help them buy a house. To help renters, the government has expanded the Home Loan Guarantee Scheme, which allows people to borrow up to 95% of the value of their property without having to take out mortgage insurance. A great position, a wonderful opportunity. Should we round it up to 800, sir? Even with government support, home ownership for millions of younger Australians remains something of a pipe dream. $932,000. $1,615,000. It's just too expensive. Could public housing provide a solution? Next on the official engagements list was a meet the people visit to a block of housing commission flats in the Sydney suburb of Waterloo. It used to be the source of great pride for Australians, even something to show off to Her Majesty the Queen. Mrs Fitzpatrick came to live in Redfern from a country town when she was married four years ago. Post-World War II, enthusiasm for low-cost housing stock nationwide accelerated from next to zero to nearly 100,000 dwellings. And it's here that the Fitzpatricks have been provided with a new brick home by the Housing Commission. Crucially, property was available to those who both couldn't afford the rent and those who could pay some rent. Public housing used to be a way into home ownership for a generation of people who had previously only rented. The overall quality of public housing began falling when successive governments sold them off to private bidders and gave little attention to the remaining stock. Some of those communities, it has to be said, do amazing things to argue for, for resources for their community, but the pressure that's on them because of the way we uh, allocate social housing only to uh, you know, this, this very tightly targeted group of low-income people in crisis puts a lot of pressure on those communities. There's now a rush on to build more public housing, but levels of stock are critically low. Research shows roughly $10 billion and over 23,000 social housing units is what's needed by 2035. A threefold increase on national social housing building rates during the late 2010s. What if, says Chris Martin, we grew the stock enough to wipe out the waiting list and expanded the eligibility criteria? That's something we could be doing with a much larger uh, social housing sector than, than what we currently have, but we don't really have a, a plan from governments to get there from our uh, very marginalised, uh, shrunken current social housing sector. To make it work, he says, you'd need local authorities to assess the housing need likely to be unmet by the private market and build social housing where it's needed. Not much else seems to be working to make housing more affordable. Um, Viom, you, um, during COVID, went in and out of uh, public housing in um, Victoria and therefore had a first-hand view of the state of it. I, I saw it uh, in the flesh and it's... Uh, I was going in and out of these places, uh, attending to people who, with COVID or who were just in lockdown because they were quarantining and... You know, it's it's really jarring to, uh, on one hand, to hear some people say, gosh, you know, having to isolate and, and lock down was a pleasant experience for me. It wasn't in those surroundings for those people. Uh, it's a pretty miserable, terrible existence in those buildings that have been neglected now for decades. And uh, it's one of those issues which just seems to compound the more we neglect public housing. I mean, I've, I've got friends in Singapore and you look at some of the public housing buildings they've got, they look, you know, amazing. Uh, and yet uh, the way we've just neglected uh, these buildings, the, the amenities and just you know, all the kind of social issues that, that tend to occur in those places, it's something that just seems to kind of compound year after year. And 
You know, it was very recently, I think it was just last week, a uh, Victorian Liberal MP um, said in Parliament that you can't have public housing in Brighton because, mm -hmm. you know, how would the, the children mix? Um, it, was a, it was a pretty disgusting comment, but the, the shocking part was the, the, the fact that she said it. Uh, it actually is not shocking to me at all that that's an attitude people hold because we've... Um, we've not really looked at this option, we haven't really developed it, we haven't really renewed it in a way that's actually just allowed a lot of the social stigmas to, to fester. And having worked there with the people uh, there, they are you know, proud, ambitious people who more often than not have just not kind of had the luck. Uh, so you know, this is an opportunity for us to you know, uh, not just fix some of the inequalities but also fix what seems to be this completely in intractable problem of uh, housing uh, affordability. Uh, frankly, I don't really have any high hope that it's going to, the top end or the middle end is even going to become um, vaguely uh, affordable through anything that's going to pull those prices down directly. I think something like you know, negative gearing just seems like it's untouchable uh, politically. Well then, let's look at the other end. Let's look at uh, not just social housing, but also public housing specifically. Yeah. Uh, Danica, it's interesting. Some of those figures, let's just go through them. 50,000 uh, families or individuals waiting up to 10 years in New South Wales. In Tasmania, the wait for social housing is almost five years for priority um, applicants. And there was some research done in 2018 that said, you know, we, we showed you in that package that about 23,000 houses are being built because suddenly it's um, in Victoria, um, in Tasmania, in Queensland, they're going, oh my goodness, all this social housing is as old as that footage we saw, right? It's all 40 years old, we need to renew it. But that, if you build 23,000 more, you don't get 23,000 more because 12,000 of them need to be knocked down. Mm. So the actual figure we might need in 10 years' time, by the mid-2030s, 731,000 public housing it's units, and that's just for low-income and homeless people. Yeah. And you would see that in the bush. Oh, absolutely we see that in the bush. And, and I mean, it's... Obviously it's an, um, an important issue for, for people to have access to whether it's affordable housing, social housing, public housing, but a way into having a stable roof over their head. But it actually makes sense as well from a policy point of view to, to have people uh, in a more stable situation, to be able to provide you know, refuge for people that are escaping from domestic violence, to be able to, you know, the CWA is especially interested in housing options for older women. women single women over 55 are the largest growing cohort of homeless people in Australia. So um, there are so many reasons why having um, good access to either affordable housing or public housing makes, makes good social sense, but also good economic sense in my view. But it's, it, it is such a, but as you've highlighted, there has been such a underinvestment over such a long time that we're, I just don't know if we're ever going to catch it up to the point that it needs to be when you quote those figures. It's just enormous. Yeah. Um, we were inspired uh, somewhat by your book, big the role of the state in the modern economy, um, Richard, where you were basically saying um, we can think big, we can do whatever, we can make whatever choices we want if it, if it makes sense. And so I guess the, the question that we're raising tonight is if you know you've got a problem with social housing and huge waiting lists for desperate people and you also know you've got a problem um, with working people who can't afford to buy a house, is there a way to join up a solution for all of that and say, could we build, could we have a big government or subsidised building sector that somehow addressed all of those problems together? Of course we could. Uh, and plenty of countries around the world do. Uh, and in certain points in Australia, we have. And to give you a sense of this, uh, in Australia right now, there's a 100% government owned agency called the Defence Housing Authority. And there's a hint in the name. Mm -hmm. It provides housing for people in defence. And there's no stigma attached. There's no shame or embarrassment attached to Defence Force personnel living in low cost, high quality homes provided to them. And I don't begrudge them that at all. But why couldn't we have the Nurses Housing Authority or the Teachers housing authority or the child care workers housing authority or, or, or some or people just... in 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 regional mm. towns reliant on tourism would talk to you about baristas and hospitality workers who they can't find yep. well of course and this is my point we could just actually have 
a housing authority that did it. Now, the numbers seem a bit scary and only an economist can tell you this, but you heard in the package before, you know, we might need to spend $35 billion, $35 billion between now and 2035 to do this. Well, we just spent $40 billion on JobKeeper for, for companies whose profits were rising and didn't need it. So Australia is one of the richest countries in the world. We say we want to create jobs for young people. We say we want to put them into apprenticeships and give them skills. We say we want to put downward pressure on house prices and make them more affordable. Well, what if, this is just crazy talk, what if we expanded the Defence Housing Authority and just called it the Housing Authority and said, please go and build a lot more houses and please rent them out to people, even if they don't work in the Defence Forces, we could create a lot of jobs, we could, uh, we could train a lot of people, we could have a lot of houses. And as you saw again in the package, we've done this before. It's not new, it's just for decades we've been told that it's wasteful and inefficient for governments to spend money on things. That was never true. And we've also sort of been trained to think that people that live in public housing should be ashamed rather than we should be ashamed for not providing cheap housing to people who need it. And, and it's interesting to think, uh, I'll come to Anna in a sec, D Danica, when did that change? Because there was a point at which Her Maj and Prince Philip were being taken through and so there was a sense of pride. There was, exactly, that sense of pride. And my grandparents were one of those couples that were granted social housing uh, in Western Sydney on the Great Western Highway and they really did work very hard to pay off that house and and it was it was a great sense of pride when they got to that point where that actually paid off the house and there wasn't this uh, you know I'm not saying there was no stigma but there was certainly not the stigma that we see today in my view around people needing access to, to social housing in particular um, and so I think you know Richard makes a great point about you know we've done it we've done it before the Defence Housing Authority is a great example you know doing that for other frontline workers low-income people who but are that essential. Is, that is the private market coming that in is and the private market saying you can invest a in solution. this and you've yeah. got a guaranteed rent yeah. from a soldier yeah. mm -hmm. and his or her family because we provide subsidised yep. housing yep. for them. Yeah, and it's providing that underlying security, even though it's the, well, it's the private market in, in a way, but it is, in a, well, the Defence Housing Authority, it's guaranteed, it's mm -hmm. sort of underwritten by the government. So there's that sense of, um, if you're an investor on one hand, you can invest in the Defence Housing um, Program as well. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of merit in looking at some of these programs and, and looking at what government can do to actually um, underwrite the whole idea of people um, getting into homes I mean, of course, we just heard from the Prime Minister about one of the things that people can do to, you know, combat um, <laughs> housing instability is to buy a house. Well, it's, as we know, it was a really out of touch comment. And uh, but, you know, maybe they could look at programs that are more constructive in terms of how they can underwrite these programs going forward for low income earners. And are thinking about what exists and there were some breaks in the budget to get people into housing. Mm. Um, how would this idea land? in Canberra if you waltzed in full of enthusiasm? Look, I think it's, uh, I think it'd be considered quite a dangerous idea here in, in the budgetary situation at the moment uh, to invest that kind of money in, in public housing or to, to move to defence housing. But it's certainly, I mean, at this stage, it's definitely worth uh, surely political parties considering all the options they have. When I listen to the discussion about, you know, public housing, whether you know, that sense of pride has ebbed away over the years, surely that must dovetail with a lack of funding to upkeep mm. places where people are living, to, to give people that pride in their living space. And you think about remote Indigenous housing as well and, and how mm. expensive that is to upkeep and, and the state of some of that housing stock too. I mean, this is a, just an entrenched issue in Australia uh, and, and you'd, you'd hope that it's one area where where governments, particularly federal governments, can can lend a hand. I mean, in the budget, we did have mm -hmm. the, that home buyer scheme increase to fifty thousand places, and that's a five percent minimum deposit. So it certainly and helps it's some people. And it's government backed, isn't it? And it isn't it two percent from memory for um, single parent families, and the government yeah. will kind of back you. You get two percent together, or you get five percent together if you're not a single um, fam a head of a single family. I think it goes, and the government will back you into the rest of the loan. 
That's right. And so it's help for some, but, you know, that's only help for a small proportion of the community. And he's still um, given the caps, wonder what kind of house people will be able to afford in a place like mm. Sydney with the market in the shape it's in at the moment or here in Canberra as well. And I was recently in Alice Springs for a story and was speaking to a lot of the tourism operators there who are just desperate for international and domestic tourism to kind of roar back to life in that part of the country. But there's nowhere for the staff to work in the cafes or to run these tourist operations to live at the moment. The housing market is so constricted. So you just see in different parts of the country these different stories, but they all add up to a lack of housing stock. Hmm. Do, do they though, Danica? Because there is an argument in one of these thousands of pieces of paper on my desk that we do actually have enough housing in Australia. Maybe it's not in the right place. Hmm. Um, but that actually we, we don't have a shortage of houses, we just have a shortage of affordable housing. Uh, somebody on the south coast of New South Wales on a, on a council offered to take me around on a nighttime tour, not looking at wildlife in the trees, but counting how many places <laughs> had the lights out mm. because they're Airbnb. Airbnbs, yeah. Or yeah. whatever, stays, right. whatever it is. Yeah. And so they're not occupied housing. And there's no kind of hotel style rent or regulation around that. No, and that's what our members are seeing increasingly in the areas, particularly coastal areas right up and down the coast, but then also inland areas, you know, COVID has been, uh, or post COVID I should say, has been great in some respects that people are looking more at domestic tourism options and we love welcoming people to the regions. We want them to come out and spend time mm -hmm. um, in our communities and we love the idea of building regional communities as well, but it's happened really fast. It's happened in a way that has has meant that some local communities aren't able to keep up with the increased demand um, on housing in their area. You know, maybe they've been saving up themselves for a deposit, um, you know, based on an expectation that a house was going to cost a certain amount of money in Dubbo, for instance, and mm. then and then the market's got away on them. Um, you know, and do you see people being pushed out of communities? Well, yeah, pushed out or, or pushed back into other, you know, more insecure options. Um, you know, looking at rent, short-term rental options. Um, moving to smaller villages that might be a very long way away but then as we've talked about as well then getting hit with extra travel costs and petrol it's just really difficult for a lot of people and so I think um, yeah the, from a regional point of view um, there's definitely a need for for affordable housing in the regions I talked about the cohort of you know women over 55 that's a really important area um, housing for young people and students as well is a really important area um, and there's just not the affordable options around for those people anymore. Via Mike I can't remember whether you ended up buying a house, but we, we talk to you a lot about it. Do you? Do you own a home? I, I'm, I'm looking to, to get one now. And, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones who, you know, frankly earns enough to get one. OK, um, so, so you're renting now. I mean, implicit in an expanded um, imaginary um, drum Thursday night public housing, much expanded public housing um, process, would be that somebody like you maybe could be convinced to give up on the notion of, of home ownership. And, and to pay a decent rent um, with some, you know, good security in the housing into public housing and, and that money would, your rent would basically cross-subsidise the rent of the, of the very poorest people because this rent is absolutely essential to the maintenance of the public housing stock which you saw in such a terrible condition. Are you, are you willing to give up on the Great Australian Dream of owning a home? Uh... I'm not quite willing to give it up yet, but uh, my goodness, I can imagine you know, a few people may well be. But yeah, part of the issue is that you know, you, you, the only way you're going to be giving up that great Australian dream of owning a property is if the alternative is enticing. And at the moment, it's, it's not. Renting is not particularly enticing. Uh, you know, it's certainly in metropolitan areas, even rent's getting qu quite expensive. But to go back to some of those issues you mentioned, just the, the security around that, the, the lengths of tenancy agreements and really quite the one-sided uh, power imbalance when it comes to mm. uh, tenancies and, and disputes... Uh, I mean, my God, you know, we had to fight so hard to be able to have kind of pets in, in rental properties uh, until recently in Victoria. So, you know, part of the whole reason why people are gravitating back towards that, um, that great Australian dream of owning a property is because renting one is not uh, a particularly pleasant experience. So if this were part of the solution that, you know, maybe, sure, maybe everyone can't own a house, well, great, let's make the renting part of it more palatable than it is now, which is not for a lot of people.